morning. Um, I'm not sure who's awake here and who's not, uh, and which side I belong to at the moment. I, I flew pretty well uh, straight from Singapore. It's, uh, it doesn't get a longer time lag than that. It's 12 hours difference. Um, well, Eric did a pretty good job of saying what complexity is about. What I want to do is give a, a logical structure. I'm enormously excited about this new move or movement in economics. Uh, and I think it is uh, significant. It's not a fad. It's not some tweak on economics. It's something fundamental. It's a fundamental change in outlook, and that's what I want to argue here for a few minutes. Eric mentioned that complex systems are ones in which the elements of the system react somehow to the overall pattern those elements create. I like to think of cars in traffic. The traffic forms some sort of pattern at a given instant, and the cars are reacting locally to whatever that pattern is for them. And in so reacting, they're recreating uh, anew the pattern to which they further react and so on. So th there's a beautiful causal loop. We need computers. Uh, if we, it's very hard to follow such systems uh, in standard mathematics, although uh, we can do quite a lot with nonlinear stochastic process theory and modern tools. But by and large, we need to turn to the computer. I like uh, James Bailey's quote here. He says, uh, use the power of the computer to allow thousands and millions of these small elements uh, to interact locally. High-level behavior, as Eric just said, emerges. Uh, why should the economy be studied that way? And the usual picture is that we got all this point of view from computer scientists and physicists. And economics got on the bandwagon here uh, quite late in the game. I would argue, on the contrary, that uh, this point of view goes back to Adam Smith and beyond in economics. For at least 200 years, economists have been thinking of the economy as individual consumers, firms, government departments, banks, investors, together creating some sort of system, maybe making a market in which prices emerge to which those elements react, or maybe creating trading patterns to which the trading partners react themselves. So this isn't a new outlook in economics. It's the fundamental outlook that runs through all of the economy. The key question complexity would ask is, how does such a system unfold? So if you're studying stars that are perhaps coalescing, coming together, individual elements, individual stars, forming some sort of galaxy, you're basically asking, with computation or some other mathematical tool, you're asking how will those elements, or in our case in the economy, how will agents react to the pattern they're creating? What will that do to the pattern? How will they further react and so on? And a lot of us in economics, especially if you're in the more applied versions, say if you're in banking or investment, that's basically the question you're asking from day to day or moment to moment. What's the next move going to be? How will that affect the system? What will emerge at some higher level? Update for prices. How will things react? How will the agents react to that in this loop? Outside forces come in and so on. So this is, I would maintain, the absolutely natural and fundamental question to ask in economics. But about 150 years ago, economists didn't ask that question. They found a shortcut. And this is the question that standard neoclassical economics asks. It doesn't, act how will the el act, doesn't ask how agents react, say, to market prices that somehow their behavior is created. It's asking a, a, a shortcut question. I call this the neoclassical finesse. 
It's a stratagem. We can ask a simpler question and say, what agent's behavior in any economic problem is consistent with or in equilibrium with the outcome that that behavior together will cause, that those behaviors will cause? Uh, Phil Morovsky, as uh, Eric said, has cataloged uh, just how this happened. It's a fascinating story. I maintain that this was the right thing to happen. If I'd been around in the 1860s and 70s, time of Jevons, uh, just before Marshall and others, this is the right uh, shortcut to take. It's led to virtually all of neoclassical economics, and we got plenty for asking this equilibrium question. But what I want you to notice is this bottom line here. That question is restrictive. It's asking only what outcomes would you see in a timeless economy. It throws time out of economics. You can only get equilibrium solutions. So to go back to that traffic thing I was talking about, you could have an equilibrium theory of traffic flow and you can see traffic moving along quite nicely in some sort of equilibrium, assuming no speed limit or something, traffic will settle to some equilibrium and there'll be a, an equilibrium flow. But in equilibrium, you can't get phenomena that happen within time, such as traffic jams. Traffic jams happen when there's a fair amount of density of traffic and they happen spontaneously. Some small event, perhaps a dog running into the road, causes a car to slow, that causes another car behind it to, to slow. And very quickly you get this emergent structure of a traffic jam. But you will not see it in an equilibrium theory of traffic flow. And so then the question arises, if we have put a massive filter, an enormous filter in front of economic theory, if we took that filter away, what else could we see? Would we see something different? Would we see something more realistic? I maintain we, we will see something different and realistic. But for me, traveling in this area, along with people like Don Farmer, uh, Sorens, and many people in the room here, um, others on the podium, this is like getting into a capsule and seeing what might be on the dark side of the moon. What would we see if we allowed the economy not to be in equilibrium and look for the structures that might emerge? Here are my candidates for what emerges. So when you take the filter off, what else do you see? Well, you do see temporary structures. Very early on in Santa Fe, and a lot of this work comes out of early work at Santa Fe, uh, that we did in the 90, even the late 80s and early 90s. Early on, we constructed a model of the stock market, and we found within that model that, that this was a stock market inside the computer. It would now be called an artificial market. This was early work in agent-based modeling before there was any such name. But when we constructed a model of the market that allowed the market not to be in an equilibrium, we discovered we were seeing many bubbles and crashes. They're structures that are temporary. They're like traffic jams. They happen spontaneously. And you don't know when they're going to happen. They happen at all scales, we discovered. We also discovered that uh, the returns from uh, one period to the next showed long tails. So the prices themselves that emerged looked very realistic in their distributions, and those distributions matched real distributions in real markets for real stocks. We discovered periods of very high volatility, spontaneously followed randomly by periods of quiescence. I was, remember I was back at Stanford then, I used to phone the guy who was doing all this work, programming it at Santa Fe, I'd say, what's the market doing today? He said, oh, there's not much happening. Then he'd phone me back and say, oh, all hell's broken loose. They've got very nervous. So-and-so's so just come into the market. 
and that's disturbed things, and that disturbing changed the dynamics of the market so that everybody else had to change too. So we got these huge cascades of change ricocheting through the system, and then that might be absorbed and the market would settle down and it would all look very peaceful again. But above all, when we compared with real world data, we found that qualitatively and quantitatively, we were getting a very, very good match. All of the, all such behavior is ruled out in equilibrium. And I'm not saying anything against equilibrium here, I'm just saying it's not quite sufficient. You see again and again that history matters. Uh, there are positive feedbacks at all sorts of scales in the economy, increasing returns, network effects, and structures forming. Maybe a structure will form by accident. That structure determines what future structures can happen. So for the first time in a long time in economics, history, real history, has begun to matter. And this emerges theoretically. Somebody was saying yesterday that one of the doleful effects of neoclassical economics was that it banished history. And indeed, the way it's taught in the UK and here in the US is that theory uh, is taught and history has been banished to, well, you can study that if you like and if you're so inclined. What we're seeing is that history is coming back, very small events lock things in. Actually, a self-referential small event here is that I published a paper on complexity in the economy in science in 1999, and the editor called me in Stanford and he said, I like your approach, he says, but shouldn't you give a name to this approach? I said, absolutely not. This should be nameless. No, no, it needs a name. So I stood at the telephone and he said, just give me a name. I said, why don't, this went on. Why don't you choose one? I said, no, no, he said, it's, it's your thing. I said, call it complexity economics. And to my amazement, the name seems to have stuck. Um, you can also see the economy forming and reforming. In the kind of models we build, you can think of a new technology coming along, maybe it's a major technology like the steam engine, or maybe it's nuclear power, or the computer. And that subtly changes the structure of the economy, which gives new challenges arising. Some of those are technological, some of them are social, that demand out new technologies. Some of those enter spontaneously, and you can build creation and combination into these models. And those new structures, that causes a new structure that has a different set of challenges. And I'm seeing the economy, the real economy, lurching from absorbing one technology, think of nuclear power, to that technology, think of Japan at the moment, uh, causing real difficulties and giving us challenges for further technology. You could say similar things with uh, all the carbon energy we have and climate change demanding new technologies. So you get a to and fro between novel technologies, structural change in the economy, new challenges, new technologies. This is very much the subject of a book that I finished last year called The Nature of Technology. The point I want to make is that once you allow this more general approach, you begin to see things like um, realistic structures in markets, that history matters, and that you can actually talk about the economy forming, the economy arising, and structural change in the economy. I want to sum up here and say that um, <clears throat> what do you get? Er Eric had two columns. And I very much like uh, the way he presented it. Uh, <clears throat> I would simply say that standard neoclassical economics, which is what I was taught for several years at UC Berkeley, um, <clears throat> and I have no uh, beef against what, what, it's very elegant and very beautiful. 
And it gives us an economics that I would say is pure. It's timeless. Because it's at equilibrium, it's optimal because we ask the agents in there if they could do something better, they would be doing it, and that would knock out equilibrium. So at equilibrium, everybody's doing their best, so to speak, and gives us a beautiful, pristine, pure, elegant economics. But for my money, that's not sufficient. When you relax equilibrium, which complexity forces you to do, you see an economy that's organic, one layer builds on top of what's already there. It's self-constructing. The economy arises out of itself, forms off itself, gives new structures and new challenges. It's always boiling and roiling with change and opportunity. History matters again and again. Uh, outcomes are historically contingent and that sets the scene for further outcomes that are history contingent. It's imperfect, and in a word, it's, well, I would say it's also messy, but you see an economy that's realistic. People have said to me, well, isn't this an offshoot of economics? No, standard neoclassical economics is a special case. And so what I'm claiming here is that probably we can we will continue to teach neoclassical economics. It's very good. It's a wonderful benchmark, and it teaches you to think about the economy. But for certain problems, you have to think differently and allow those to be out of equilibrium. When you allow out of equilibrium, you see a different world. And for me, the most curious thing about the different world you see, and this comes in full circle, the world you see with complexity economics overlaps the world that political economists have seen for the last 200 years. So there's a great paradox. As we get more mathematical, more scientific, and more logical, and more rigorous, and go deeply into complexity, we go right through this pristine world, come out the other side, and what do we see again? we see a political economy where there's structural change, there's small events mattering, there's history mattering, and there's formation, and there's decay. It's a world that uh, Richard Bronk has written about. Thank you very much. <laughs>